We're going to be in the book of Job today. Job, who lived during the time of the patriarch, so probably around the time of Abraham or somewhere between Abraham and around Jacob. And so we're going to deal with hopefully the whole book today is the plan and get an overview of the book of Job today and see its purpose and use for us. Let's begin our time with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, I thank you for your word, even for a book like Job that considers suffering in such detail. Lord, I doubt any of us have suffered to the level of Job, but Lord, all of us have suffered personally what feels like the suffering of Job. Lord, help us to see that you are good and gracious and merciful even in our suffering. That this is a good thing for us. This is mercy and grace poured out on us for our benefit, for your glory. Help us to trust in you, though it seems as if you slay us. Help us to be reminded that our Redeemer lives, or that we would trust you no matter what we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, even as Christians, we practically sometimes have a simplistic and inaccurate view of suffering that even mirrors the understanding of Job and his friends. We often think like Job that we should not suffer because we don't deserve it. Like his friends, sometimes we falsely equate suffering with sinfulness and success, comfort, and ease with righteousness. In conjunction with these inaccurate thoughts and beliefs, suffering affects our view of God himself, either pushing to deem God too transcendent to care about our suffering, or that something is wrong with God in his imminence because he will not bow to our demands to remove the suffering from us. And so as we consider Job, we should ask a question, does suffering draw us closer to God or push us further away? When you suffer, do you wallow in self-pity and anger? I know that's my often go-to. Or do you expect and demand that God give you a life of ease and comfort with trouble, without trouble or suffering? Really, can we see the mercy and grace of God even when we are suffering? Job, uh, a book sometimes not delved into because of what it covers. Suffering really does uh, encompass the entire book. Between suffering from friends who, if you have those sort of friends who needs enemies, suffering losing your wealth, losing even more dearly your children, losing your health, having your own dear spouse tell you just to curse God and die, even suffering to the point where you question, God, why are you doing this? I've been a righteous person. And really, as we come to the book of Job, we should frame it in God's mercy and grace as we've been doing with Genesis, because it's God's mercy and grace is what permits our suffering. You know, Job does not get the introduction that we do. In the book of Job, Job has no idea what's going on in heaven. He doesn't know what what Satan is accusing and what God is permitting. Job has no idea about this, but God here permitting what he does is part of his mercy and grace. 
And so we should start, we should come from the point of view, from the scriptural understanding that first of all, God's mercy and grace is what is permitting our suffering. And we should see that God permits this, permits us to suffer for our good. Now, often we don't think of it that way. The small child at the doctor's office does not think that injection is a good thing. But preventing disease is a good thing. God's mercy and grace permits us to suffer for our good. Notice here from Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 4, The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is that this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? This is God responding to Job, his demands to have God answer for why is Job suffering? Job doesn't deserve it. He's righteous. He, he holds on to that he's a righteous person. And God's first response out of the whirlwind is, Who is this that is speaking and wants to give me counsel? In fact, he tells Job, dress for action like a man, prepare yourself. I will question you and make it, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And Job in chapter 42 answered the Lord and said, I know not, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel with knowledge? Therefore I've uttered why I did not understand things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here, and I will speak, I will question you, God say, telling Job, and you make it known to me. I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, Job resp responds to God's question here. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust. In ashes. God is permitting this for Job, first of all, for his good, in that he comes to a deeper understanding of God. Our good and suffering here is from a deeper, comes from a deeper understanding of God. Notice when Job comes and he plays his complaint out God, what are you doing? God, what are you doing? And God returns back with, Who's this that's talking, please? And Job finally in 38 and 42 responds with, it was too wonderful for me. Your ways can't be thwarted. You, you're doing something I don't understand, God. The first piece of good that is permitted in our suffering that comes out of it when God permits us to suffer is us understanding God in a better way. Paul, the apostle, was permitted to suffer not just trials and suffering from, from beatings and uh, many things like this, but even was given what he describes as a thorn in the flesh. To bring him to humility so he won't get too proud in, in what God has called him to do, and so that he would be relying on God more so he would learn about God in a greater way. So our first, the first thing we see is, yes, God permits us to suffer for our good, and this is so that we come to a, uh, come to a deeper understanding of our God. In chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I proceed no further. Job here, after being questioned by God, God says, dress for action, get ready. I'm going to question you. You tell me what I've done. Tell me about my plans, Job. And Job's response is, I think I'll hush up now. I opened my mouth, stuck my foot in, and added a little pinch of salt. I'm going to put my hand over my mouth. I'm small of account. Chapter 42, Job answered the Lord and said, I know 
Now I know that you can do all things that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I uttered what I did not understand, these things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak, I will question you and make it known to me. I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. What's his response to seeing God metaphorically here? Therefore, I despise myself and then repent in dust and ashes. The next thing that we see that comes out of our good that God permits from our suffering is not just a deeper understanding of our God, but our good and suffering comes from a deeper understanding of ourselves. We realize who we are. Job realized, I am of small account. I'm tiny. Job even says, these things were too wonderful for me. And now, because I've seen who you truly are, God, I repent of my self-righteousness in dust and ashes. Our good in co- comes in from a deep in suffering comes from a deeper understanding of God and of ourselves. To know who we truly are in the face of God. We are His special creation, yes, but we only have value in God. God's mercy and grace permits our suffering. Romans 8.28, Paul says it this way. We know that for those who love God, the very ones who Paul and Jesus and Peter and John all say expect to suffer. Jesus, if the master suffered, what do you think they're going to do to you? Paul says it this way, though. We know for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. God, in his mercy and his grace, permits us to suffer for our good. All things work together for our good. Those who love God. Suffering is one of those. When we read Romans, we, we sometimes we don't think of suffering as part of that good. When we read Job, we're wondering, God, did you really have to put Job to the test? Did you really have to let him suffer? Did you really have to let Satan have so much power over him to, to cause such dire suffering? Even in our own times of suffering sometimes we go god why are you letting this happen and the the great answer is for our good so we will know god so that we will know ourselves god's mercy and grace permit us to suffer not just for our good but a twin and even greater uh, reason is for god's glory to glorify God, to make Him great. Job chapter 1, verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered, The Lord said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? You realize God is the one bringing Job up? Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Why is God bringing up Job to Satan to receive glory from Job? And Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for no reason, right? Don't you realize what you've done for Job, God? Have you put, not put a hedge around him, his house, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Don't you realize how much you've given Job, God? No wonder he likes you, God. But stretch out your hand. Touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. This is Satan telling this to God. 
The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in, is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. God is permitting this to happen, allowing Satan to do this for God's glory. Even Satan, though he doesn't want it, is working for the glory of God. Chapter 2, the second time Satan comes. There was again a day the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered, The Lord said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. The Lord said to him, to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? God brings it up again. There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He's, he's living a life that glorifies God, Satan. How, what do you think about that, huh? He still holds fast to his integrity, not just uh, an uprightness here, but that he has not cursed God when all his possessions and his children were taken away. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan said, answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. Notice Satan only has the power that God permits. Here's a man similar to Job in the New Testament. Jesus addressing him. He passed, as Jesus, he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not this man who sinned, it was not this that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Why does God bring up Job to Satan twice? So that in, Satan, in Job, the works of God might be displayed. Why was a, mo a man born blind in the day of Jesus? What did he do? What did his parents do? Jesus says, neither one of them sinned to cause this blindness. It was so... The works of God could be displayed. Why is Job suffering? To show the glory of God. Why do we suffer at times? It's to show the glory of God. God's mercy and grace permits us to suffer for God's glory. The old Puritans said it this way in one of their prayers. There is one thing that deserves my greatest care that calls forth my ardent desires. That is, that I may answer the great end for which I am made, to glorify thee who has been given me being. Puritans here praying and writing down this prayer expresses the only reason I exist is to glorify God. And that even my suffering is part of glorifying God. This is why Job is suffering, is to glorify God. To prove to Satan that Job being righteous is because of who his God is. God's mercy and grace permit us to suffer for our good, for God's glory, and to suffer for the benefits of others. Have you ever wondered about Job's friends? Wondered why Job didn't ask them just to leave. In fact, he even says how horrible counselors they are, how little comfort they are to him. Why is Job's friends there? So they can see one suffer for the glory of God, for their good, and so they can know what it's like. God's mercy and grace permit us to suffer for the benefit of others. Notice here in Job chapter 42. After the Lord has spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, 
My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for he have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Eliphaz, you and the other guys have a wrong view of who I am. Why did Job suffer? So these three friends can have a right view of God, know who God really, truly is. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up burnt offerings for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, and I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Eliphaz, gentlemen, you don't really know who I am. Why does God permit us to suffer so someone else can see who God truly is? For their good. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namathite, went and did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Would it be good for us to suffer if it caused just one person to accept Jesus Christ? Would it be worth it? Paul in Colossians 1 says, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. I'm rejoicing that Colossians, even though I've never met you, that I'm suffering for you. Filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. Not speaking in a salvation way here, Paul, but that he is experiencing suffering so that the Colossians don't have to. That is, the body of Christ, his church. Could you respond to suffering like Paul? I'm glad. I rejoice in it when I'm suffering for you, so that you would know the sufferings of Christ, so that you would see what Christ has done for you, so that you would finally accept what Christ has gone through for you. <coughs> could we understand, could we agree with that God's mercy and grace permit us to suffer for the benefit of others? Sometimes you and I are suffering so someone else will see how one suffers with God's grace and mercy in their life. That though He slay me, I will trust in Him no matter what comes because I know my Redeemer lives. God's mercy and grace is what permits our suffering. God's mercy and grace is at work through our suffering. God's mercy and grace work through our suffering. And the first way it does that is God's mercy and grace works through our suffering to correct our self-centered importance. You know what Satan said? Skin for skin, you'll, a man will give anything for his life. He's right. Most of us, when it comes to our lives, would give up anything to keep it. God's mercy and grace works through our suffering to correct that. Notice in Job chapter 27, Job again took up his discourse and then said, As God lives, the God who has taken away my right, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Have you heard him blaming God yet? The God who's taken away what? My right. What rights do we have before the Almighty? None. He is our creator. We bow before him. The only thing we have is what he gives us. And yet he says, God's taken away my right. He's made my soul bitter. How dare God? You think Job is a little self-centered at this point? A little in the pity party, a little in the suck his thumb and open a can of worms. Blaming God. My lips will not speak falsehood, my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it for me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity. 
Job responding to his friend saying, God's taken away my right, and I know I've not wronged God. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. In fact, it gets to the point that the three friends of Job ceased to answer him because he was righteous in his own eyes. I think Job was a little self-centered. All he saw was it hurts now and I did nothing to deserve this. What's God accomplishing in Job's life? Job, you're not the end all to be all. Would you please tell me about Leviathan, Job? Would you tell me how I created everything there, Job? You want to know? How, how, Job, tell me how does the sun stay in the same position and the st- other planets move around it, Job? Of course, Job gets corrected pretty quickly and finally puts the hand, his hand over his mouth and shuts up. Part of what is happening here is God's mercy and grace is working through Job's suffering to correct his self-importance just like it does us. God's mercy and grace work through our suffering to correct our self-centered importance and also to correct our faulty and incomplete view of God. Sadly, in our day, there are whole swaths of purported Christianity that believe that only God wants only our good and success in a material fashion. They look at the old patriarchs, somehow they miss Job. They say, well, God blessed Abraham. God must want to give me all the cattle. We have a gospel course. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's true. Everything is His. And yes, God does often bless us even beyond what we deserve. But to equate blessing and the lack of suffering with righteousness is wrong and incomplete. And so God's mercy and grace works through our suffering to correct this, to show us who God is. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job is finding out and realizing and confessing now, God, I know you're all powerful. Anything you say will happen is going to happen. Nothing you purpose can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel with knowledge? Therefore I uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Job is getting his view of God corrected, that yes, God is near to him, but God is so much more. And that sometimes, even in his nearness, as he walks beside us, as some of the gospel songs describe, that he is also greater than us. And his way is perfect all the time. Hear, and I will speak, I will question you, and you make it known to me. I heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now. One of the best things that happened for Job in what he went through is that now he sees God. Now he knows God more personally. Now he sees out of the whirlwind the glory of God. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God, now I understand in a better way who you are. Why does God permit us to suffer? Part of it is to work through that suffering so that it will correct our faulty and often incomplete view of God. So that we would know Him better. Also, God's mercy and grace work through our suffering to correct 
our world's false theology. The world has a theology about God. It is often almost always wrong always incorrect and false. And here, the three friends of Job espouse the world's theology about God, and God corrects it. The Lord spoke these words. The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant. Job. The whole contention of Eliphaz and uh, the other two friends of Job throughout the book is, Job, you must be suffering because you sinned. God only punishes, God only lets suffering happen to the wicked. If that were true, why would we ask questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? Of course, we fail to recognize that, as Jesus says, none, there is none good but God. But even if we, we dismiss that for a moment, and even if we just go with believers and those who, who are living vibrant lives for God, why would, should they suffer if God does not permit them to do so for His good, for His glory, for their good? If our world is right that God only brings suffering to the wicked, then what is going on? Has God lost control? Eliphaz and the three friends have, have badgered Job, just repented. God will take away the suffering. Job, you must be really wicked. You must have some really hardened secret sin here. God's response to these men is, you've not spoken what is right. You have no idea who I am. Your theology is false, Eliphaz. And so, therefore, take seven bulls, seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job shall pray for you. I'm not even going to listen to you, Eliphaz. Job has to pray for you. And I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And notice the only reason Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar aren't struck down is because the Lord accepts Job's prayer. Why? Because they have a false theology. And they hammer it to Job. Job, just, just repent, would you? If you just repent, all this will go away. Sitting there in the hospital, enjoying the neurological gift the army imparted with, to me, one of the doctors in all seriousness said, well, if you just accept it, it will go away. And that's what Eliphaz has been doing. That's what Zophar, Bildad have been doing to Job. Job, if you just, God will take it away. Because they do not see the glory of God in what's happening to Job. So God's mercy and grace works through our suffering to correct our world's false theology. When Christians suffer with grace and mercy, it serves as a great display of the glory of God, that God is good enough, great enough, that suffering now is nothing compared, as Paul says, to the glory that will come. Thirdly, last, we see that God's mercy and grace is what brings us through suffering. Only through the mercy and grace of God do we even make it through. And God's mercy and grace reminds us to trust God regardless of the circumstances. Do you notice in our scripture reading Job 13, 15? Though he slay me, I will hope, I will trust, I have confidence in Him, in God. Even if God kills me, even if that's His plan, I will trust Him. 
I have my confidence in God. Can we say that? Can we understand that God's mercy and grace reminds us to trust God regardless of the circumstances? Notice how Paul says it in Philippians 4. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. He's trying to communicate to the Philippians that he's not trying to get them to send another gift. Because he has learned in whatever situation I am to be content. This was my mother's moving verse because she hated to move and we moved often growing up. And in the King James it says, whatever state I am to be content. I think it was taken a little too literally there, but... Paul is not just talking even here about financial issues because he has just addressed the Philippians and their gift to him. But really he's talking about all the suffering he's been through for the cause of Christ. That whether I'm being stoned to death and left for dead, I'm content. Whether I'm being whipped to 99 save one, to be content. Whether I'm shipwrecked, to be content, whether I am in chains or free, to be content, because I know I can trust in God. And even if you were to kill me, I can trust God. So God's mercy and grace reminds us to trust God regardless of circumstances. And lastly, God's mercy and grace reminds us of our redemption by God from all sin and all suffering. Job chapter 19. Something I don't know if any of us could say. Going through what Job was going through. Having lost everything. Having lost our children. Having been told by our spouse to just curse God and die. Having been badgered by those who are supposed to be our friends that just confess the sin. when well, we know there's nothing to confess. And still wondering, God, what, what's going on? Not having been party to God getting glory out of this suffering. I don't know if we could come to the point like Job, and say, for I know that my Redeemer lives. It's amazing how New Testament Job sounds. I know that my Redeemer lives. Remember, Job lives somewhere between the time of Abraham and Jacob. He lives even before the law is given. The only thing he knows is to sacrifice this is thing that's been passed down since Adam. In fact, in the beginning of the book, we find that Job would go and after uh, his children would gather together and have a birthday party, he would go and make sure that they all had sacrifices done for them just in case one of them cursed God. And yet... Job knows about his Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. Job is looking forward to a God standing on earth. And after my skin has, th has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Job reminds us of our redemption, that one day God will redeem us from sin and suffering. Isaiah 25, verse 8, another Old Testament passage tells us that one day He, the servant of God, and God Himself will swallow up death forever. And the Lord will wipe away every tear from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth for the Lord has spoken. God has said it. It cannot be turned back. It's a promise. 
It's an edict from the very mouth of God that this will happen. And our suffering reminds us that God is going to fix it all. That one day the redemption will not only save us from our sin, but remove the suffering. And God will wipe away every tear. Revelation 7, 17. Looking forward to the day this happens, the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And He will guide them to springs of living water. And God, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Again in Revelation chapter 21, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And this God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. This is what Job is looking forward to in Job chapter 19. Job had a pretty good developed theology about God and the future. He knew God had promised in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that he would fix the sin problem and all the things that come from it. And so, in God's mercy and grace, it reminds us of our redemption by God from all sin and suffering. Why does God let us to suffer? To remind us He's taking it away. The, the sin problems, the these problems caused by sin throughout this world, the disease, the famine, the wars, all of it, it's being taken care of by God. God's mercy and grace permits our suffering, is at work through our suffering, and is what brings us through the suffering, knowing that our Redeemer lives, knowing that we can trust God no matter what. And so, honestly, do you curse God? Or do you glorify Him in your suffering? It doesn't even have to be a direct uh, profanity directed to God. It could even be like Job. You've taken away my right, God. But really, what right would that be? You are dust. And you will return to dust, Job. So do you curse God or do you glorify Him? The reality is every one of us will suffer. Whether it's, it's God permitting through, through natural means a disease or through a relationship or, or through even direct persecution, each one of us will suffer. What's our response? We should also ask, does suffering correct our thinking? Does it correct our thinking and our beliefs about ourselves and about God? Does it change our, our self-centeredness that everything is about us? Does it make us look to God and say, may God be glorified? Can we be like the blind man? who was blind since birth through to adulthood, and the whole purpose was so Jesus could walk by and heal him. Maybe we need to be blind to suffer so that someone else can see the work of God in us and glorify God. It really comes down to this. Do you trust God? even when you suffer. When it hurts the most, when it's darkest, when the hope 
has left. Do you still trust God? Of everything that Job went through, and even partly in his response, demanding his rights, he still trusted God. Do you trust God when you suffer? Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we ask, Lord, help us as suffering will happen. Lord, we pray that we would trust you. We would trust you no matter the circumstances. That we would trust in the redemption that we have through Jesus Christ. Lord, work in us that we would glorify you even when we suffer. That it would change the way we see you, that we would be less self-centered, that others would see you in us. And that in all these things, your name would be high and lifted up and glorified, that the worth of ascribe to you that you deserve would be done. Or give us the ability to say that we know our Redeemer lives. And though he slay us, we will trust in him. But help us to take the lesson from the book of Job to take it and we would glorify you even in the days that we suffer. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.